Greetings, Attorney Derek DeBras here. Derek DeBras, Munitions Law Group, munitionsgroup.com. Look us up. Go ahead and click that icon in the lower part of your screen. Make sure you follow us on all social media, including especially YouTube. Uh, sorry, it's been a couple weeks since I've been with you guys. I just got busy. Uh, some of you may know I own a small farm, and my wife and I get pretty busy during this time of year as the weather gets nicer. So I apologize for that, but uh, more information coming to you. i got three videos that we're recording uh, today that are going to be put into the queue. Uh, we're going to be discussing um, a refresher on felons in possession and restoration for purposes of felonies. The reason I'm doing that is in the very next video, I'm going to go through three exceptions and one that does not apply. And I think that's important that we have that backdrop. Uh, so we'll go over felon case, uh, felons in possession case law and the analysis. And then in the next video, we'll go over three different exceptions when that does and does not apply. Um, also tying in a misdemeanor crimes of domestic violence. And then lastly, I'm going to go over another brief review of NFA trusts as the weather gets nicer. I've been getting a lot of calls about trusts, people wanting to get into the NFA market. Um, I know that might be repetitive to some of you, and I apologize for that. But I think it's important that we continue to dust that off and make sure everybody understands what's going on. So with that said, if anybody's tuned in for the first time, my name is Derek DeBras. I have been practicing law for over 16 years. Um, for those of you that follow me, you all know me well enough. Um, so everybody is on the same page with me, NRA annual meetings coming up. Uh, I think it's in Dallas this year. If you guys have not been, Dallas is a fun town. I will be there and uh, I will actually be teaching at the NRA legal seminar. So if you are an attorney or just have an affinity to punish yourself and sit through an all day continuing education seminar on the law and guns, please sign up. Their website is available. Uh, I think you can purchase tickets right there. It's not overly expensive, but if you want some of the best and brightest information on gun law in the country, that's probably the place to do it. So let's jump, jump right in. We're going to be talking about the Gun Control Act today, 18 U.S.C. 921 at sequence, specifically in 921 section of the Gun Control Act. That's our definition section. We're going to be looking at section A20, the definition of crime punishable by greater than one year in prison. And then A or uh, 18 U.S.C. 922 subsection G1. I remember from my previous uh, videos, there is nine disabilities under federal law. They're G1 through nine. So we're, we're speaking to the citation when I say the G1 disability. Commonly referred to as the felon in possession law, uh, and I have explained this before, simply being a felon doesn't mean you cannot possess guns. I had a client recently, he uh, was charged with a felony, a fifth degree in Ohio. Uh, he's an old gun trust client, actually. So we can tie in gun trust, and I'll probably talk about that on my gun trust video here in a couple weeks. Um, but in any event, he called me and said, hey, you know, I was uh, drinking, had too much to drink, got pulled over, DUI, gun in the car. In Ohio, that is the lowest level felony you can be charged with. So we're clear because this, um, if you're going to impute this to your own state's law so you can understand the analysis. What we're looking for here under 18 U.S.C. 921A20 uh, or the definition is uh, it's got to be a felony. You have to be convicted of it, and it's got to have the potential for greater than one year. Not the judge sentences you to greater than one year. The judge can sentence you to no time at all or time served or probation. If the potential, the maximum, if they threw the book at you, was greater than one year by a day, then it attaches. In Ohio, our lowest level felony or felony of the fifth degree is only punishable by exactly one year. It falls a day short, so you can actually be convicted of a felony fifth degree, i.e. improper handling a firearm in a motor vehicle, otherwise known as being drunk with a, uh, a gun in the car, that conviction is only punishable by one year and therefore the uh, disability does not attach. Now, it goes further and a lot of people don't know this, a lot of attorneys don't know this, if it's a misdemeanor and it's punishable by greater than two years. So in Ohio, we don't have any misdemeanors that are punishable by greater than six months, so that just would not apply at all across the board. Some states do, so keep that in mind. So now that we know what um, the disability actually is, how it attaches, so it's got to be a conviction. It doesn't apply to juvenile adjudications. Now in your state it may, like in Ohio, our disability statute 2923.13 talks about both convictions and adjudications. Um, the state gets to determine what's a conviction uh, under federal law, and in Ohio, conviction is a conviction. An adjudication is an adjudication. They're two separate and distinct things. That doesn't mean, as a juvenile, you can just go out and possess a gun, or because you have this juvenile adjudication, you're fine. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, there's other elements of the law we would want to look at, especially state law, but it, on its face and based on case law, at least with regards to how the state of Ohio looks at convictions and adjudications, an adjudication is not a conviction. 
So we know what would cause a disability to attach. Uh, let's, let's go on from there, and I'm going to point out a couple notes that uh, I've always picked up on as I've taught this subject matter. So the first thing we're going to want to do if we have this conviction on our record and we want to get rid of it or get our rights back is we have to look to the jurisdiction where the proceedings arose. So a lot of people will move, they'll get convicted in Ohio, let's say, and they've spent the majority of their life in California or in Texas. Let's use Texas. California's own bird. So, but in Texas, uh, they may call me and say, hey, I need to get my rights back. Uh, what do I need to do in Texas? Well, you don't do anything in Texas, at least not at first. Texas may say you don't have your gun rights for Texas purposes, but to fix the federal issue, we have to go to the jurisdiction where the proceedings arose. And that is in Ohio. But let's change the facts a little bit in our hypothetical. Let's say your conviction was in federal court in Ohio. We'd have to go to federal court in Ohio to fix it. So when we talk about the jurisdiction of the proceedings arose, it's not only the state, but the court that has jurisdiction in that state. So for a federal conviction, they're next to impossible to fix. Um, there are some exceptions. You'll see that in the next video uh, for certain business offenses, but that's not a fix. That's it never attached. Um, there is a restoration law at the federal level, but they don't fund it. Congress being they, they never provide money to hear those applications. So you can't get a restoration. Uh, you can try to get a presidential pardon. Good luck. Um, there is no, to my knowledge, federal set aside or expungement uh, statute or rule. Um, I, it does exist based on some case law research I've done, but it's in extraordinary circumstances for expungements. So essentially, if you have a federal crime, I've never, uh, to be very frank with you, been able to fix one. Um, they're just unlikely to happen. It's unlikely to be able to fix these types of charges. But most of the issues we, that we run into are state-level convictions, and most criminal convictions out there are going to be generally state-level convictions. Uh, so we can fix those, and in most states you can fix those. There's some method you can do that uh, through. But again, we look to the jurisdiction where the proceedings arose, and that's where we start. So my hypothetical gentleman's convicted of an F4, let's say, I don't know, grand theft. Uh, they moved to Texas. They need to fix the federal issue first because if they just fix the Texas issue, they still can't own guns under federal law. They need to hire an Ohio attorney to fix it at the state level. Once it's fixed at the state level, the state of Ohio and federal the federal government should recognize those gun rights as being intact. But if that person wants to remain in Texas and use guns in Texas, we need to hire Texas counsel now to find out, hey, uh, does Texas still consider this a conviction or a restriction on gun rights? And what do we need to do to fix it, if anything? Uh, it's, it's an array of um, different uh, positions that the states take. I believe Florida, uh, it's either based on case law or in a statute, will specifically recognize another state's restoration. I believe Tennessee won't. I believe Washington State generally will, um, and I can go on and on and on. They're all just kind of over the place, and there's been case law on something we call the full faith and credit clause where people have challenged this, that one state should have to recognize this in another state, and uh, that's not been fruitful. So where we're at is if you get your gun rights restored, we need to start where the, the proceedings arose and the jurisdiction and state where they arose, fix it there. We get good on side of the federal government and in the state where the conviction occurred, uh, and then we go to the state where you live in if we need to. And any other states you want to visit. I have clients that will fix their gun rights and they can own guns in Ohio, but they may need to travel and want to have a gun in that state. We have to look at that state. Okay. When we talk about restoration, another point is a lot of people think in their mind, well, if I get a court to just say, hey, I can own guns, I'm good to go. That's not necessarily true. The first part of the analysis is, is one, have you lost your right, your civil liberties, your, your three core rights of citizenship? And this is all based on case law, uh, primarily the, um, the Cassidy case and the Karen case, C-A-S-S-I-D-Y, and the other case is C-A-R-O-N. And those two cases are kind of pivotal to the whole restoration analysis. Um, and in any event, what those cases essentially hold, in part at least, is that when we're talking about restoration, you have to lose your rights in order to get them restored. And that's based on another case, U.S. v. Logan or Logan versus United States, I believe. I'm looking at my notes real quick here. Bear with me. And it, in fact, would be... Uh, it looks like it's Logan versus United States. Sorry about that. But what Logan basically essentially held was you can't restore something not lost. And when we talk about restoration, again, based on Karen, based on Cassidy, we're talking about the three core rights of citizenship. Put guns aside for a second. The first part of the analysis is... Can I vote, hold office, and serve in a jury? Have, have they been lost first, A, and then have they been restored? Can't restore something not lost. I know it's, it's counterintuitive, trust me. 
I think it can be very, very confusing at times. Supreme Court, I believe Justice Alito even said that during a, a domestic violence case that was before the court. Um, it is, is unquestionably complicated. Um, and it has some bizarre out, outcomes, right? Uh, in Ohio, misdemeanors don't lose those rights. So I can get convicted of a misdemeanor crime in domestic violence. Maybe I push my spouse. Um, can't get a restoration. I don't lose those rights to vote, hold off, and serve a jury. Therefore, I can't restore them. Even if the state restores, gives me a, a, a document saying I can own guns, it doesn't work for federal purposes. Um, and so you have to lose the rights in order to get them restored. Um, with regards to holding office, sitting in a jury, and voting, sometimes the state may only restore part of those. It's got to be a full restoration. So Karen Case uh, basically stands for the proposition, ban for one, ban for, all, ban for all. If you still have a restriction, the restriction still exists. So we need full restoration on those three rights. So the first part of the analysis is, have I lost these three core rights? If so, have they been restored? If so, then the last part of the analysis is, is there a restriction on my gun rights? So this is where gun rights comes into play. So first off, are my civil liberties lost, then restored, and has is there any restriction on my gun rights? Um, this is called the unless clause. And the way the law essentially works, it says if you got a restoration, you can own guns, unless your gun rights are further restricted. Um, so the, un the invocation of that unless clause. Now this also applies not only to possession or ownership, but also concealed carry, and there's some case law out there on that. So. Uh, if I get a uh, restoration of gun rights, but for whatever reason in my state I can't carry a gun concealed, still don't have my gun rights intact for federal purposes. Got to remove all those restrictions. So as an attorney, what I always do is, is I, I always tell their lawyers when they're going down this road, is first make sure the three core rights are intact. Once they're intact, then you have to find out what roadblocks are to gun possession and or the mode of carry. If there's any roadblocks, we got to remove those roadblocks to alleviate the invocation of that on what we call unless clause. Okay, um, let's see here. Um, so sealing of the record comes up quite a bit. Um, you know, under federal law, when you look at the way you get your gun rights back, a pardon from, again, somebody with jurisdiction, so the governor, this can get a little bit nuanced. I don't want to get too much in the weeds on pardon. That might be a video on, in and of itself. Um, but if I get a conviction in Ohio and I am, you know, living in another state and I'm trying to get my gun rights back in that state, a lot of people say, well, I should get a pardon from the governor. Well, the governor might not have the ability to pardon you because the conviction didn't happen in that state. So you want to look at the pardon process in each state. Some of them, um, the uh, pardon and parole boards or whatever, governor's office or whatever department handles pardons, may also handle specific types of restoration of gun rights um, applications. So you want to look at that as well. Um, but sealing. The law actually says pardon is one way to get your gun rights back. Restoration of rights, a set aside, which is usually a criminal rule, to basically remove a plea that you've made because of some sort of constitutional defect. Or the very last one, um, again, pardon, uh, 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 set aside, restoration, or expungement. Not sealing of the record. They are different. And in Ohio, until recently, we didn't have expungement for the most part. We had it for certain, ju certain juvenile offenses, but not for adults at all until April of last year, 2023. Um, and expungement is not sealing. Attorneys, I can't tell you how many times, would, would say it's the same thing. They would tell their clients the same thing. It's not. It's not. Not for gun purposes. It never has been. Um, so if the record's not a completely obliterated, Essentially, if there's anything that's hanging on that can be used against you in a sealed record, the after effect, if you will, um, then it's not been expunged for purposes of the Gun Control Act and does not work. Uh, generally speaking, though, sealing can serve as a restoration of rights. It's the way it used to work in Ohio. Once you sealed your rights, you were restored to all their civil rights not restored. So again, the right to vote, hold off, serve in a jury. And it removed your, ability to have, your inability to have a concealed carry license. So then I was eligible for a concealed carry license once I hypothetically would have had a sealing of the record. So once those things occurred, you had what we call restoration. You didn't get your gun rights back by virtue of expungement. A lot of people would say that is actually through restoration of rights. So a little bit of a nuanced uh, analysis, but that's essentially the nuance, the, I'm sorry, the analysis for felons in possession. Again, determine what jurisdiction you were convicted in. We go there to fix it. Once we go there, we have to look at what tools they have in place to make sure I can vote whole office, serve on a jury. Those rights might be automatically restored as well. In Ohio, they are. Once you're off what we call paper or off probation, um, you can vote whole off serving a jury, and, and except in very limited circumstances, such as you were 
holding office and we're stealing out of the public fund or something like that. You, uh, your rights and holding office in the future are severely restricted. But most convictions, you can vote hold office for jury as soon as you're off paper. So then the question becomes, well, I got my three core rights restored. Is there any restrictions now on my gun rights? And generally there are in Ohio. Um, any felony, you can't have a concealed carry license. So let's just use that. Say you have an F4 grand theft. Well, you can own guns in Ohio, at least the state of Ohio, as far as they're concerned, because it's not violent. It's not drug related. So they don't care about felons. It doesn't matter what degree, as long as it's not violent or drug related. And so um, as far as Ohio having jurisdiction to restore you, it arguably is not there, but you can't have a concealed carry license. You can make an argument that you can get a restoration based on that. And there's a split in state level case law on that we don't need to go into today. But there's an easier option, and that's just simply sealing or expunging the record. And once it's sealed or expunged, it removes again that roadblock to having a concealed carry license and therefore re uh, uh, gets rid of the invocation of the unless clause, meaning you have a full restoration now without restrictions on your gun rights and you can possess firearms at that time. Um, let's see here. Anything else I wanted to cover on this? Um, that's pretty much it. Um, my associate Michael is going to get on a video for everybody, and he's going to go over some updates in case law. Uh, we've kind of touched on most of that through these videos over the last few months, but he's going to kind of compact it all into one. So next video, I'm going to talk about some exceptions to uh, being a felon in possession of guns and also a misdemeanor crime and domestic violent offender uh, in possession of guns. There's exceptions built into the law uh, that I want to clarify on that. So thank you guys for sitting with me. I'm sorry if this was redundant, but I'll keep the information coming. And if you have any questions, please drop them in the comments. And as always, make sure you be safe out there and carry on. Thank you.